Welcome to Chapter 4 in the Ancillary Withdrawal Series. In this chapter, Dr. Morgan and I continue our conversation from Chapter 3, where we reviewed highlights of the clinical guidance. In Chapter 4, we will address implementation and workflow. If you haven't yet watched Chapters 1 through 3, please take the opportunity to do so. You will find them all on the MCTAC website. Also, we at CASA MCTAC have included our contact information at the beginning and end of each of our videos. Please reach out for assistance. We're here to help. Thank you for watching. Let's talk some about staffing. Yes. Because I think that there are, although yes, it is important to have guideposts, there's also some key critical pieces within the staffing yes. that I think would be important to address. Yes, and uh, those key components are things like a physician who could be available 24-7. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're using buprenorphine, it's with the way the current, current federal regulations are written, it needs to be a physician because only physicians can prescribe buprenorphine. Got it. Um, if you, for some reason, I don't know why you would do this, but if you weren't, you, if it's anything other than buprenorphine, uh, a nurse practitioner would be able to be the one who was on call. So okay. you might have a combination of those two, two different professionals. Got it. Um, and then there needs to be, and that needs to be 24-7. Mm -hmm. We don't expect them to sleep there. We don't <laughs> expect them to necessarily see the patient. It's just being available, being available by phone. Yeah. Then a nurse also needs to be available to take the phone call directly from the patient. That could be a physician's assistant as well. Um, but a nurse needs to be available to take the phone call to be able to decide when to call the doctor or when to call the nurse practitioner for an order. And so, um, again, that nurse doesn't need to be in the outpatient setting. She or he just needs to be available with a phone uh, that, that could be reached. And then, of course, we need, uh, we need all of the other people that you need in any in any treatment in center. any treatment center yes and so that's very important i think one of the other things that is very important is that there be communication between everybody right so um if for instance one of the things we had to teach our counselors i'm going back to that again yeah, but, yeah. but this is an important part of what we're talking about when we talk about involvement of the other professionals we had to teach the counselor that when the patient appears sedated in group that's something that the doctor is going to want to know about mm -hmm. just because the doctor prescribed the medications the doctor needs to know or the nurse practitioner needs to know when those side effects are occurring right. because maybe that person is getting a different dose than they need to be getting. So the communication between the professionals is something I think we have to talk about as well. Tell me something about the facility. What does the facility need to look like, feel like? Oh. What are some, some supplies I might need to have on hand? Well, you'd need vital sign monitoring equipment. You would need um, uh, some kind of uh, testing so that you could do rapid toxicology testing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because when you're initiating the um, initiating the uh, withdrawal mm -hmm. uh, uh, treatment for withdrawal the ancillary withdrawal uh, treatment um, then um, uh, uh, then you would want to be able to test it as I as I said before the other thing that you want is you want a facility that um, actually is feels safe this is all just good care mm -hmm. i mean i think it's what we need in every single facility um uh and uh we need a place where we can do an exam mm -hmm. uh because we're so going to be starting privacy. medication that's right and uh the the uh medical staff will you know many of us have our own stethoscopes but maybe it's a good idea to have a stethoscope there mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well just mm -hmm. so that you can do that kind of a uh, that kind of listening to the patient mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. So you want what you need for a physical exam mm -hmm. in the facility, and you want a place to do the physical exam, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and then you want um, the milieu to be um, to be quiet. Not not necessarily quiet. I don't mean that, but but a safe place, mm -hmm. a place where someone who may not be feeling at their best could be comfortable and feel respected to have their needs met 
and, and to go through this experience. Right, because before, when the person develops the symptoms mm -hmm. or the signs of withdrawal, mild to moderate withdrawal, they are going to experience that discomfort. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to take that discomfort away. But during that period, you're absolutely right. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. What would be important for providers to know about what is a key component of a medical assessment? I imagine everyone watching this is engaged in medical assessment, provides medical assessments now. What in particular within ancillary withdrawal services do they need to additionally pay attention to? Well, I, I think the important thing is to start the medical management in, in as efficient a way as possible. Um, and so the, many of the things we've talked about already with vital signs and, and that kind of thing, um, and uh, physicians um, uh, generally want to do a history and a physical before they prescribe a medication for a mm -hmm. patient, which is good medical practice. Mm -hmm. And so all of those things need to be done. Um, but I think one of the key components that um, we don't talk enough about, honestly, um, is explaining to the patient what the ramifications of this process are. Uh, patient education. Correct, yeah. And that includes more than just talking about um, talking about uh, medication effects and side effects. Mm -hmm. Those are very, mm -hmm. so, so at that time, it's a great time to begin the process of talking about, hey, what can we offer you after this? Are there some things that we can do? Um, one of our components in our guidance is that there would be a plan for additional medications if they are indicated. Mm -hmm. And if, mm -hmm. the, if the physician and the patient are you know, decide that those. So that's a good time to start talking about those things. Another good thing is to start talking because most of this stuff, if it's an outpatient program, is going to go home. The medication's going to go home with the patient. Right. It's talking about safe storage. Oh, wow, right. Um, you know, talking about uh, what to look for at home, mm -hmm. uh, how to keep this stuff away from children, pets, mm -hmm. other vulnerable individuals, um, uh, and um, talking about how the medications, and I think this is a great opportunity to talk about how these medications fit in with your recovery plan. Now, what does this mean to you? Because you're taking a medication that can have some psychoactive effects right now. Mm -hmm. How does that fit into your recovery? Mm -hmm. And it's a great opportunity to start addressing, uh, you know, what what that means. And and it, because there may be other times that a patient needs to take mm -hmm. medications in their recovery, mm -hmm. and it's a great time to talk about what the relationship is between an addiction specialist and the patient. I don't mm -hmm. mean to burden the patient at a time when they are uncomfortable sure uh, but initially there are some things that and then as the as the relationship continues between the physician and the nurse uh, and the patient or the nurse practitioner or physician's assistant whatever um, it's a great time to continue to talk about stuff like that and to talk about hey these are just medicines you know your treatment is really this this and this and so, isn't that amazing so dr. Morgan as you're speaking I'm thinking about how we talked about team earlier in our conversation mm -hmm. and now we're bringing the patient into the team exactly. just as you're continuing to have dialogue with the staff about what this process is about what it's important is what their role is in the process you're going to have that same conversation with the patient because the patient is a critical component of the team oh, you said it great all right <laughs> so next i would imagine as we said earlier this is all integrated into treatment, and so just as in anyone's treatment, there's a psychosocial assessment and treatment planning. Is there anything different here, or is it continuing to be the psychosocial assessment and treatment planning that providers do now? I would say it's the same okay. with the addition of the medication, you know, okay. that there's a plan for that as well. But and it's, probably it's really the piece that you said earlier about making sure that the patient and the team understand what the role of the medication is in the overall recovery plan. Right, and you know what it's like? There was, a, there's a definition of serenity, mm. okay? And, and it's, it, they say that it's like a duck gliding across water, mm. but underneath it's paddling like heck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it looks so smooth. So the way that the medication should really fit in is that it's the below the surface stuff where right. we're 
maybe paddling like heck, and right. we're doing a lot of work. But for the patient, it, it should be like this. Mm -hmm. And they should be able to, to understand that the other stuff is what's really gonna make the difference. The other things that they're doing right. is what'll make the difference in the long run. That, like everything, medication can't stand alone. Correct, yeah. Um, general medication administration procedure. How about here? What could what do um, should providers expect, and what should patients expect through the induction process? Well, the assessment is very very important, of course, and and then there's um, uh, then there's the initiation of medication mm -hmm. with buprenorphine. There mm -hmm. are things that are specified in the tips manual, and uh, and people are not doing it exactly as it says in the tips manual sure. anymore, with good reason. I mean, because we've. We've learned more since right. the TIPS manual was written. Uh, but there could be other medication as well. And, and so there could be an observation period after the patient takes their initial dose of medication right. in the program, and that's a wise thing to do. Um, and then I think the other thing that's so important, and we alluded to this before, is that just because a patient has one substance, which is, you know, um, uh, coming to the top right now, right, right? Right. doesn't mean that there's not other substances that could be, uh, could be act active in the patient's history and that will need treatment as well. So there could be more than one thing. So an evaluation of that. Um, then another thing that would happen is you'd, you'd write a prescription for the patient and the patient would go get that filled. Mm -hmm. So we're in outpatient settings, right. in most cases, right. we are only prescribing medication. Um, now, an OTP mm. is a different kind of thing altogether. Right. Because in, o, in an OTP, you could actually, um, actually dispense mm -hmm. buprenorphine or methadone, if you have that kind of a license to be able to do that, to the patient. So, but in other cases, most physician practices, most outpatient programs are not um, not in positions to be able to dispense or administer medication. Some are, but only only specified. So the majority so. of community-based organizations that have a clinic yeah. are prescribing only. Correct. And then and then uh, there may be an opportunity to have the prescription delivered. Uh, that would be unlikely if it's buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. The patient is going to have to mm -hmm. go pick that up, him mm -hmm. or herself. But there may be an opportunity in some settings to have the medication delivered to the clinic and given to the patient. Probably depends on your region. It does, I would think, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, integration into treatment process. Can you say something about how this works? You may be um, a patient in a clinic where some people are going through this service and some are not. Or is there any, any opportunity there for specialized services for me in pr the process of ancillary withdrawal? Am I integrated into the general population in the clinic? How does that work? We think that um, in most cases, in my experience, is that um, people will just be able to be integrated into the regular, uh, regular um, Clinic Run setting. Mill clinic setting. Yeah, I mean, you can't tell the difference between mm -hmm. somebody who's getting good ancillary withdrawal treatment and somebody who doesn't need it. That's great. Yeah. Okay. And and so cognitive function improves. Another reason to right. do this. Physical uh, discomfort improves, mm -hmm. and so the patients actually don't have to fidget in their chairs. Right. 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 You know, um, which we're not doing, Carla. We're doing beautifully. It's very impressive. It isn't is, it? isn't it? And. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that is really, really good that can go on here. And so, yes, our expectation is they would integrate right into the program. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how about clinical services? Do we want to say anything in particular there? Um, I think that one of the most important things with somebody who has a substance use disorder is to find out in the case, for, for instance, of alcohol use disorder or mm -hmm. opioid use disorder, if there is an indication for, and if the patient is desirous of continuing medication. Okay. And so that is one Following of the most- Following the ancillary withdrawal process. Right, right, right. And some people may decide during the withdrawal process that they want to, um, want to per their minds may change mm -hmm. so it's an ongoing discussion with the patient mm -hmm. you know and even if the patient is not desirous 
of, uh, for instance, let's just take buprenorphine, which is a right. great medication. But if the patient, for some reason, doesn't want to continue to take that, there still should be a discussion of Vivitrol. And the other thing is, if buprenorphine is not going to be able to be prescribed because of some sort of uh, 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 condition that the patient has in his or yep. her life, yep. which makes it impossible to give uh, to do office-based opioid treatment in the future, we expect that every effort will be um, expended to get that patient into an OTP where they could get methadone treatment. Got and there it. are people, we have the three different medications for opioid dependence that are approved and we would really like uptake of all three of those medications from our providers. Then the other thing is, I, I mean we need to not forget that there are three FDA approved medications for alcohol use disorder. Mm -hmm. And while disulfiram isn't used much anymore, it can be useful in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. And certainly acamprosate and uh, naltrexone, long in acting injectable naltrexone, are good medications that can actually enhance recovery. So we don't want people to be forgotten about. And then our providers um, are sometimes using other medications with good results for other substances that may not be FDA approved, but those are things to think about during the process as well. Great points. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also thinking about time frames. So as a provider, I may be thinking, how long does this last? How does, what are the time frames I need to be thought, thoughtful about when I start this process? Ah, the beautiful thing about ancillary withdrawal is it's tailored to the patient. It's not prescriptive. Um, so I may it, go through the process in X number of weeks and you may go through the process in X number of months. Correct. And it's symptom driven. Uh, and, and it's such a, that's, that's what I love about this. It, it can be done that way. I mean, it's conceivable that people, and there are withdrawal protocols, which are basically this on day one, this on day two, and this on day three. And they're okay. Um, and, and, and people get good results with them, but I think the best results come when, when, we, uh, when we do a symptom-driven process. I'm hearing you talk mm -hmm. a lot about shared decision-making and listening to the patient. Oh, yeah. Just thought I'd highlight that. Thank you. I would hope that everybody finds that this is as satisfying and rewarding to do as I do. And um, You clearly do. Dr. Morgan, I can't thank you enough. And I, I want to thank you, Carla, for your expertise as well. And well, thank all you of the so much. Insight that you have too. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching. We hope that this is useful to you.